Throughout their time as a band, the Beatles went through several permutations that can be easily followed by listening to their music. The way it transformed from simple rock and roll and teeny bopper hits to psychedelic rock, art pop and beyond. It's music that soundtracked the cultural movement of the 1960s and would go on to greatly influence artists for decades to come. But working in parallel with their music are their films. From the British Invasion era of 1964 all the way up to their breakup in 1970, the Beatles were involved in five official films that featured the band as pseudo versions of themselves. The pop star version, the cartoon version, alter egos, and finally the version that was simply them as they were. My name's Elliot and today I'm going to look back on the five official films of the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, Help, Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine, and Let It Be, and analyze how the Beatles' identity and evolution as a band informed these films, and how these films in turn informed their identity. And going further, to examine these movies' lasting impact on film and pop culture after almost 60 years. Now before I begin, don't forget to become a sub subscriber. Subscribers. And we're going to of course begin with the film that launched the Beatles into the stratosphere. And it's called Hard Day's Night. On February 1st, 1964, the Beatles had scored their first US number one hit with I Wanna Hold Your Hand. One week later, they touched down in America for the first time to play a limited run of concerts and appear on The Ed Sullivan Show, where 73 million American viewers, or about 40% of the population, tuned in to watch their performance. Beatlemania was in full swing. Almost immediately upon returning to the UK, the Beatles were to start work on their yet to be titled debut feature film. A film about and starring the Beatles, what would such a thing look like? I remember Brian getting very excited about the fact the Beatles had been offered a movie. Of course, he'd done a deal with United Artists, not for one, but for three, as a kind of package deal. There had been some slapdash attempts at translating pop music to films, such as Summer Holiday, starring Cliff Richard. I'll be a bachelor boy, and that's the way I'll stay. And those very wooden Elvis movies where the focus was more on his romantic pursuits than on his actual music. She's a distant cousin, but she's not too distant with me. Basically, the standard of these films were quite low, and the Beatles naturally did not want to be a part of that. It was critical that this film get the tone, the energy, and the spark of the Beatles just right. And so it was decided, in part by the lads themselves, that the director of the film would be Richard Lester, who had previously worked with Spike Milligan, Peter Sellers, and The Goons, an English comedy group predating Monty Python. Lester had also achieved critical acclaim for his short film, The Running, Jumping, and Standing Still Film from 19. 1959, where I'm sure you can already notice a stylistic similarity to A Hard Day's Night. But as important as the direction was the writing. The Beatles were fans of the 1959 television play No Trams to Lime Street, which featured a detailed and accurate depiction of life in Liverpool. The writer of the play, Alan Owen, was then chosen to write the screenplay for A Hard Day's Night due to his clear aptitude for Liverpudlian dialogue. Lester and Owen not only watched the Beatles play live in Paris, but also spent several days with the group. This allowed the writer-director team to get a sense of them as individuals, their personalities and quirks. The Beatles mentioned to the creative pair that their lives were like, quote, a train and a room and a car and a room and a room and a room, which would greatly go on to inform the flow of the film's sequences, beginning with its opening scene. Like a bullet fired from a gun, the opening chord of the title song launches us into the pure pandemonium of Beatlemania. The introduction of the Beatles running from screaming girls perfectly mirrored the movie theaters around the world that were attended by girls and boys shrieking with utter euphoria at their idols up on screen, the two forces bouncing off each other. By the way, every time I watch this opening sequence, I can't get over how hard George Harrison eats shit running down that street. <laughs> Then like visibly checking his possibly bleeding hand afterwards. This is all part of the film's personality. If there was a mistake or if something unexpected occurred, it would be left in, which only heightens the feeling of spontaneity and pure excitement exuding from every frame. This early scene of the Beatles on the train and a second later running alongside it signals to the audience that this isn't a straightforward film. There's something a little zany and not quite conventional at play here. But make no mistake, there is nothing amateur about this movie. Within the first minute, we witness Dick Lester's unmistakable talent for visual language, the likes of which had, until this point, never been paired on screen with pop music. 
Lester's background directing documentaries, commercials, and utilizing relatively new techniques like handheld shooting really came in handy with a hard day's night's energetic pace and limited production schedule. Not to mention a budget of only 500,000 US dollars or barely 5 million in 2023. While not inventing techniques like jump cuts and run and gun shooting, Lester synthesized these techniques into what Roger Ebert would go on to call the modern style. What Dick Lester really did revolutionize was his direction and editing of the musical scenes. Techniques like cutting a take on the beat, jumping between shots of the band playing and shots of them having fun. This is the music video formula and it all started with A Hard Day's Night. I was told that I was the father of MTV and I wrote back and demanded a blood test. What complements Richard Lester's cinematic innovation in A Hard Day's Night is the sensational music of the Beatles themselves. While they weren't yet at their creative peak, Early 1964 was the time that the Beatles were conveying their broadest appeal to audiences everywhere. The rock and roll of their earliest years was evolving into a bright and irresistibly catchy pop sound rooted in pure joy. From the perky R&B of Can't Buy Me Love soundtracking the four Beatles literally jumping for joy in a field, to the infectious doo-wop chord changes of Tell Me Why play to a worshipping crowd of youngsters. The euphoric music needed to be supported by equally exuberant action and A Hard Day's Night completely delivers on this. Audiences had never seen anything like it. Even the stuffy and pretentious film critics couldn't help but surrender themselves to the electrifying charisma of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Critic for The New Yorker, Brendan Gill, wrote in 1964, quote, Though I don't pretend to understand what makes these four rather odd-looking boys so fascinating to so many scores of millions of people, I admit that I feel a certain mindless joy stealing over me as they caper about uttering sounds. As with their music, the Beatles' arrival on film felt like they were beamed from the future. When you watch the scenes from the movie without the Beatles in it, it's as if you're back in the olden days of stiff and stuffy films featuring conventions of the pre-war generation. But then the Beatles burst onto screen and propel the audience into modern day and provide so much colour even though the film was shot in black and white. And although the story is rather simple, 36 hours in the life of the Beatles as they prepare for a television performance, the film is still a rollicking adventure and the lads, though not actors, ooze charisma and charm because they have something that most other films struggle to capture, a genuine friendship and unmistakable chemistry among its lead cast. In Alan Owen's original version of the screenplay, he had packed it with all these easy one-liners just in case the Beatles couldn't act, but it became clear that the four of them were so naturally charismatic that they ditched the one-liners in place of new material to reflect this. We meet them properly in this early scene on the train, which features the four of them standing up to a stuffy older passenger. Look, mister, we pay for our seats too, you know. I travel on this train regularly, twice a week. Knock it off, Paul. You can't win with his sword. After all, it's his train, isn't it, mister? And don't take that turn with me, young man. Not in an aggressive or rude way, but merely cheeky and playfully at odds with authority. I fought the war for your sword. I bet you saw you won. I shall call the guard. Ah, but what? They don't take kindly to insults, you know. This kind of harmless cheekiness matched the real-life approach of the Beatles confidently turning banal press conferences into games of their own amusement. I had one yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> These lads were harmless, but they were untouchable. Observing the Beatles individually in this film is equal parts amusing and fascinating. To me, the most natural acting talent of the group belongs to John and George. John had the ability to translate his natural wit and sarcasm to his character in the film, which is much harder to do than you think. I now declare this bridge open. Comedians who are naturally funny can tend to clam up when given lines to learn and deliver, almost like the spontaneous humour is sucked out of the performance. But John Lennon is genuinely hilarious. This clip here of him batting his eyelashes in the most uncomfortable way, it's like he's in an Eric Andre skit. Give us a kiss. Not only that, but he nails it with the straight acting too, demonstrated here in a scene he shares with actress Anna Quayle. All right, Noddy. Oh, Who knows? Yeah. It's your nose is very. Is it? I would have said so. Oh, you know him better, though. I do not. He's only a casual acquaintance. That's what you say. For a moment, it's as if you're watching a Fellini or Godard film. 
George's acting abilities all stem from the fact that he never overdoes it. Hey, you won't interfere with the basic rugged concept of my personality, will you, madam? He's laid back and sardonic, just like the real George, and brings an amusing nonchalance to the film that I'm very drawn to. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know. I thought it just sounded distinguished like George Harrison, the scars of distinction. In fact, years later in The Guardian, director Dick Lester said that there's no question that George was the best actor of the four. I think he's actually pointed this out a few times. Apart from Ringo Starr's first lines in the film. Well, if he's your grandfather, who knows? <laughs> He ultimately provides a cute and charming presence all throughout. His eel-like expression, plus his standout solo scene walking around town looking all down and out, gave him a sympathetic character that was easy to love and what propelled him through his string of films in the 1970s. It's Paul McCartney that really struggled the most in the acting department. While he has his moments, like when he's putting on a heightened character or voice, Excuse me, but these young men I'm sitting with wondered if two of us could come over and join you. Oh, that this tutu of solid flesh would melt. He definitely seems to be the most preoccupied with how he's coming across, and it results in Paul never quite feeling present in any scene he's in. Like here, their first scene with dialogue shot for the film, and despite them all being nervous, you can see that Paul is completely in his own head. Hey, pardon me for asking, but who's that little old man? Uh, what little old man? That little old man. Oh, that one, that's my grandfather. I don't know what to do with my hands. What do I normally do with my hands? This remained the case 20 years later when McCartney wrote and starred in his own feature film, Give My Regards to Broad Street, which you can see me talk about here. Richard Lester later spoke about McCartney saying, The problem with, with Paul is he was so enthusiastic towards cinema, film, uh, art, the zeitgeist, what's going on, that <clears throat> sometimes that got in the way. I think Paul sometimes tried harder than he should have. Paul McCartney, the man who is just constantly doing the most. Also, shout out to Wilfred Bramble's performance as Paul's mischievous grandfather, who honestly used to scare me a bit when I was younger. Ah, uh, sure, that's what I want you to think. All coppers are villains. But now I find him genuinely hilarious and kind of camp as well. Congratulate me, boys. I'm engaged. Oh, no, you're not. Despite its uproarious nature and jubilant appeal, a Hard Day's Night also depicts how the Beatles had become prisoners of their own fame who were constantly seeking to break free. In no uncertain terms, the film shows explicitly how John Paul George and Ringo go along with the pandemonium and participate willingly in it, but struggle to come to grips with the fact that they are part of a larger machine in which they have little control over. This profoundly reflected their real status at the time. They were being skyrocketed into fame while their management was hastily organizing record, merchandise, and touring deals that the Beatles themselves scarcely had the time or wherewithal to consider. This all makes A Hard Day's Night the perfect representation of 1964 Beatlemania. It not only matches the fresh and joyous music with equally thrilling and forward-thinking cinema, but it crystallizes the Beatles' untouchable presence in culture, where unshakable confidence to defy class, convention, and authority rippled out into the minds of young people all across the Western world. The 1960s had officially begun. Now, before I continue, I just want to say that if you're enjoying this Beatles video, I actually have a ton more over on my Patreon page. From my thoughts on Paul McCartney's latest photo book, to a ranking of the Beatles anthology albums, a deep dive into their many side projects, even my thoughts on their changing fashions over the years. Every month, I upload a bonus video on whatever topic my patrons decide on, and if you'd like to be a part of that, the link is in the description. I love making these videos, it's what I do full time, so any kind of support would be immensely appreciated. All right. All right, back to the video. And up next, we've got... I never needed anybody's help in any One year after the commercial and critical success of A Hard Day's Night, the Beatles released their follow-up film... Help, I need somebody. Now, instead of stretching a tiny budget and shooting in inexpensive black and white, Richard Lester, who was back to direct, was given a budget of 1.5 million US dollars, which allowed for the film to be shot in vibrant color and additionally filmed all over the world. This was partly based on the Beatles' own desire to shoot in exotic locations. They wanted to ski in Austria despite never having skied, they flew to Austria to film a skiing sequence. They wanted to soak up the sun in the Bahamas, they shot on the Bahamas. The Bahamas was still British territory at the time, so Brian Epstein was also keen on shooting for the tax exemption. So with a generous budget and the whole world at their feet, 
How are Dick Lester and the Fabs gonna pull off a sequel to A Hard Day's Night? Would it even be a sequel? We didn't want the Beatles to just make a color version of Hard Day's Night. We couldn't show them in their private life, which would be the next logical extension to it, because that was by then certainly X-rated. The Beatles themselves were feeling far more confident in terms of their acting abilities. The guys knew they weren't good actors, but they also knew what they were capable of getting away with on film. And so instead of the fictionalized documentary style of A Hard Day's Night, we're treated to a proper action comedy caper that's closer to a send up of a James Bond film, which in turn sort of makes it feel very Austin Powers and only predating it by 34 years. It's a thingy, a fiendish thingy. This new cinematic style makes for some glorious shots of the Beatles doing something crazy in dazzling color. It just looks fantastic. The plot does, however, leave something to be desired. An Indian cult is preparing to sacrifice a woman to their goddess when they notice she's not wearing the sacrificial ring. Who could possibly be wearing it? Why, Ringo Starr, of course, and now he can't take it off. The entire film is this cult chasing the Beatles all over the globe in an attempt to retrieve the ring, or failing that, sacrifice Ringo directly. Obviously, given that this film is nearly 60 years old, there's plenty from this portion of the movie that hasn't aged well and is pretty culturally insensitive. Without minimizing this, I will say that movies were still making these kinds of plot lines, cultural gags, and short-sighted casting errors right up to about a decade ago, so I'm not wagging my finger at it, I'm more just letting you know what you're in for. Help shows us new sides of the Beatles, with extended scenes of dialogue, proper Hollywood stunts, and the fact that they apparently all live in a kind of bizarre Bird and Ernie type setup. Here's where I can see what Dick Lester meant about this film not being able to reflect their private lives. But while this film doesn't exactly show us a more intimate side to the Beatles, it does make great use of their skills as entertainers. They were certainly more at ease with the filming process, but perhaps maybe a little too at ease. By then we were smoking marijuana for breakfast at that period and we were well into marijuana and nobody could communicate with us because it was just four glazed eyes giggling all the time, you know, in their own world. Yes, it had been quite the year between films, and amongst the hectic recording, touring, and filming schedules, the Beatles found that getting blazed was the best way to handle the intense lifestyle. This approach really does come across in help. We had fun in those days. While the lads still contained plenty of charm and charisma, it's less wide-eyed and more red-eyed as they stumble their way through the more dialogue-heavy scenes like this one set in Buckingham Palace. These these scenes are where the film really tends to drag, with Lester opting for longer held shots with fewer cuts, meaning the Beatles had more lines to remember and you can tell they're barely able to recall any of them. And I think that was one of the reasons for not learning the script. We just sort of showed up a bit stoned, you know, and sort of smiled a lot and hoped we'd get through it. So despite help clearly looking more expensive, there are scenes here which do feel more amateur than In A Hard Day's Night, a film that has zero pacing issues. But even though Help contains its fair share of sluggish moments, these same scenes converge on the absurd. Like, why do we hold on John dialing the phone for so long? This kind of thing is also what differentiates help from a hard day's night. There's more here than meets the eye. Ho ho! Ho! Ho ho! Ho! Ho 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 ho! Oh! Ho! Ho ho! It often reads like a proto stoner comedy film and in the right conditions could have you and your viewing party in hysterics. Like, check out the completely stupid ADR of the Beatles tobogganing down the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> They're absolutely taking the piss, particularly John Lennon. Oh, cold, 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 cold snow. But it's bizarrely enjoyable. Let's play a game, eh? Yeah. Beep beep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are they doing? What keeps the film on track and where it does sometimes outshine A Hard Day's Night is its wonderful musical sequences. The music video style that Dick Lester merely experimented with in his previous endeavor, he fully masters in his follow-up. Every shot of You've Got to Hide Your Love Away demonstrates a sharper eye for composition and a feel for the emotional tone of the music. Even down to the miniature narrative of George trying to get the attention of Eleanor Bronze's character who, of course, only has eyes for Paul. 
Despite their lack of skiing abilities, the Beatles absolutely pop against the snowy white Alps in Ticket to Ride. George Harrison gets his moment on I Need You, performed around the corner from Stonehenge with some fantastic camera work on the band's instruments. Particularly this shot down the neck of Paul's Hofner bass in the night before. The Beatles have rarely looked as cool as they did during the Another Girl scene. I mean, for the most part. However, it's You're Going to Lose That Girl that I consider to be one of the best looking sequences, not just in the film, but in all of 20th century cinema. The silhouette of John set against a haze of vibrant purple, aided by the swirling tendrils of Ringo's cigarette smoke as Paul and George sing back up with their mirrored guitars and hands mere inches from each other. There's truly a divine quality to these shots, with even their beetle haircuts illuminated like halos. While I know that in reality it was in the rather stark walls of EMI Studios where the Beatles recorded most of their music, the way I picture them doing so is greatly informed by this gorgeous sequence in Help. Richard Lester tapped into a truly timeless, romantic style here that I think greatly contributed towards the alluring power of the Beatles' mid-60s image and again, the future of music videos. Boys, are you buzzing? Oh, no, thanks, got the car. But an inescapable fact about the process of filming help is that John, Paul, George, and Ringo were essentially growing out of this phase of the Beatles machine. They were bored of the silliness and identifying less with the mop top image of themselves. And coming from a place of pure aesthetics with this film, could you blame them? Why are their haircuts combed so straight here? George genuinely looks like he's got a brown bowl in his head for the whole film. But in all seriousness, this same identity crisis was happening elsewhere in their lives as touring towards the end of 1965 was starting to become an exhausting chore. They were playing more or less the same run of pop tunes for crowds that couldn't even hear them, and they were questioning what they even represented as a group. This is why they were smoking pot on set so much. Not only were they bored, but back in the studio they were expanding their minds and experimenting with different sonic textures. Artists like Bob Dylan were beginning to fuse the folk and rock sounds to create something entirely new, and that's where the Beatles' minds actually were. They were coming into their own as artists and were ready to challenge and excite the world anew. And so after the release of Help, that's exactly what they did. Releasing perhaps the greatest triple run of albums in history, Rubber Soul, Revolver, and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The Beatles were on top of the world. Not only had they shown everyone that Beatlemania was more than just a passing fad, they'd established themselves among the great artists of the modern day. But where do you go once you reach the mountaintop? The Beatles' answer was to dive further into the fantastical swell of surrealist psychedelia. Magical Mystery Tour, which is one of my favourite albums because it was so weird. A lot had transpired between 1965's Help and the summer of 67. Aside from the aforementioned albums, the Beatles had also stopped touring, began experimenting with LSD, learned to meditate, with George Harrison in particular becoming absorbed by Indian music and Eastern philosophy. There was a lot going on, and in May, shortly before the release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Beatles had signed on to their third film to finish out their contract with United Artists. This would be a kooky, psychedelic journey called Yellow Submarine, a fully animated film based off a song from their previous album, Revolver, but that movie wouldn't be out until 1968. For now, the Beatles were just happy to release Sgt. Pepper to the public, an album that they had worked very hard on. It was a group effort by the whole band, but it was Paul McCartney who spearheaded much of the direction. The concept of alter egos, the Edwardian marching band attire, and sound of the opening number, and the general idea around a concept album. This grand and out there approach really paid off as Sgt. Pepper became an instant cultural and artistic sensation. McCartney felt vindicated by the risks that the Beatles took and his confidence rose to stratospheric levels. But only two months on from the release of Pepper, the Beatles lost their faithful manager, Brian Epstein, to an early and unexpected death. But he was just a beautiful fella, you know, and it's terrible. What are your plans now? Well, we haven't made any. You know. I mean, it's only just, we only just heard it. Yeah. Despite having drifted further from Epstein's influence, the Beatles had never been completely rudderless like they were in the autumn of 1967. It was, uh, it was chaos after that. We were kind of managing ourselves, really. It was sad, you know, it was very sad to lose an old mate under those circumstances. But uh, I don't think the major worry was, oh, what are we going to do now? We haven't got a manager. Because I say we'd been moving away from that. Now, Paul McCartney, throughout his life, has responded to death in an idiosyncratic way where he never seemed to want to show his grief, 
be it in the case of his mother, or even John Lennon. This may come across as callous, but I believe it comes from a place of protection. And when Brian died, I believe Paul wanted to protect his fellow Beatles and not allow them to fall into a depression. Plus, I think he was also keen to not let the artistic momentum drop. Paul made an attempt to carry on as if Brian hadn't died, you know. I think Paul had an impression. We should be thankful for what he did, you know. For, for keeping the Beatles going. So, despite just having released an album with a burgeoning animated film in the works, Paul decided it was best to commence work on yet another project, one that he'd been tinkering with since the beginning of the year, inspired by home movies he'd been making. It all came from the question of how the Beatles could reach their ever-expanding worldwide fan base now that they had stopped touring. McCartney's solution? A 60-minute TV special directed by the Beatles titled Magical Mystery Tour. It was Paul's idea. It was basically a charabang trip, which people used to go on from Liverpool to see the Blackpool lights. In addition, the film was also inspired by countercultural icon Ken Kesey and his 1964 cross-country American tour on the Further Bus featuring his merry band of pranksters. Counterculture was in the air, but a structured idea for a film was not. I think it was Paul's idea. I know that he and John, and they just like drew a circle, right? And then marked it off like the spokes on the wheel. Uh, in my brain, it was Paul's idea. He came with a piece of paper. <laughs> it was just a great way we used to work. So in September of 1967, with a plan that was quite literally paper thin, the Beatles set off to a decommissioned airfield in Kent, as that's all that they could book on such short notice, to begin production on their latest endeavor. Within the first few minutes of watching, it's readily apparent that the polish of a hard day's night and even help would not be found anywhere in this film, let alone a discernible plot. Basically, a group of random people plus the Beatles set off on a British mystery tour. And already the magic is beginning to work. Once they're away, strange things begin to happen at the hands of four or five magicians, also played by the Beatles, and their road manager, Mal Evans. They've clearly borrowed things from their other films, like instead of Paul's grandfather, this time we've got Ringo's aunt. And as with A Hard Day's Night and Help, the tone is light and comedic with occasional musical breaks. Each strange occurrence in the film, be it this overly long army recruitment scene, or this chaotic race around the runway, are completely random events and feel totally disconnected from anything else happening in the movie. The Beatles were making it up as they went, and everyone could tell. The film meanders and stumbles far more than any other Beatle movie, and yet it's the shortest of all of them. It's messy, sometimes it's quite gross, and George Harrison barely features, but that's more of a personal grab. A song. Despite all this, Magical Mystery Tour does have its moments of brilliance, and as you may expect, they mostly come from the music sequences. The Beatles' music since finishing Pepper had been a lot less focused and a lot more far out. It was a period where they indulged in as many sounds, instruments, and effects as they could. If an idea came to them, it was going in the song. The song that perhaps best represents this period is I Am The Walrus. I am here as you are. John Lennon number involving nonsense lyrics and a cacophony of sound. The version in the film shows the Beatles playing the song with psychedelic instruments and wearing far out clothes. The alter ego approach from Pepper returns with the twist of Lewis Carroll as the Beatles don various animal masks such as a walrus, a march hare, a hippo, a parrot, not to mention John's own appearance as the Eggman. Elsewhere in the film, you've got Paul's jaunt to France, where he pranced and posed, which resulted in the artsy Fool on the Hill sequence. And nobody seems to like him, they can tell what he wants to do. Trippy, multicoloured scenes of Icelandic mountains became the visuals for the Beatles' first proper instrumental track, Flying. Of course, if you don't count Cry for a Shadow, which I'm not. My personal favourite is the depiction of George Harrison's song, Blue Jay Way. It's a kaleidoscopic odyssey into Harrison's shift into keyboard-based music. The melancholy vibe of the song is matched by dark and moody projections, along with whimsical moments of the Beatles messing about with a white cello and football in a garden. We've even got a performance of the Bonzo Dog Doodah band, led by, of course, Vivian Stanshell playing the song Death Cab for Cutie. Death Cab for Cutie. Another favourite of mine is the campy Paul McCartney fever dream, Your Mother Should Know, which closes the film. Your mother should know. Ooh, your mother should know. 
We would never again see all four Beatles performing in such a goofy, foppish way after this, and personally, I believe its charm lies in its imperfection rather than its attempted elegance. Such as when George drops his salute too early, which causes him and John to start giggling. No need for another take, this is the spirit of Magical Mystery Tour in a nutshell. Apart from its musical sequences, the film doesn't account for much. That is, aside from a couple of ahead of their time scenes of genuine surrealism. Beginning with the unexpectedly sweet scene of Ringo's aunt and Mr. Blood Vessel falling in love on a beach to a sweeping orchestral version of All My Loving. And there was a few funny scenes. I mean, the scene that to me that stands out is the one of John shoveling the spaghetti onto the fat woman's plate. <laughs> I mean, that was the best bit of the movie for me. Oh, and of course, this moment of pure cinema. See that, fellas? Oh, 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 talk about your magical mysteries. I spent half an hour looking for that sugar, I tell you. Magical Mystery Tour premiered on Boxing Day 1967 and was considered the Beatles' first ever commercial failure. This was in part due to the fact that it was screened in black and white. And of course, they showed it in black and white. It was hated. You know, they all had their chance then to say they've gone too far. What does it mean? And for a film where a large portion of its appeal is its vibrant colour and psychedelic effects, this was a massive error of judgement on the BBC's part. I mean, comparing them side by side, and yeah, this, <laughs> this looks like hot garbage. I was half an hour looking for the sugar. <laughs> the Beatles had officially flopped, or boomed, as it were. And given that this happened at a particularly traumatic time in their career, it's often seen as the beginning of the end of the band's united upward trajectory. Soon after the film's release, the Beatles began exploring their own individual pursuits. George with his scoring of the film Wonderwall in India, Ringo moving into film acting. Oh no, this no good. And John becoming enamored with a certain Japanese American artist. It was as if Paul's pseudo leadership and magical mystery tour became the impetus to expand their own horizons. And we know from future projects that Paul's need to protect what he loves would often be perceived as a need to control, a paradox that would never truly resolve itself. From this point on, the Beatles would never be the same tight unit they once were. End of part one, intermission. End of intermission. Part two. After a hard day's night and help, John Paul George and Ringo were well and truly done with acting in Beatle films. The band were contracted to appear in one more, but they were simply not those cheeky young guys with matching haircuts anymore. They were men who were expanding their consciousness, getting into the avant-garde scene, and setting up their own business. The image people had of them from their Beatlemania days was closer to a cartoon than reality. In fact, beginning in 1965, that's exactly how they were depicted in the Beatles TV series, which aired regularly all the way up to 1969. Well, it's worth a try. Should we have a go at it, lads? Why not? Well, there's no use whining over spilled wine. The series was considered fairly cringy by the band at the time and became a mere footnote in their history. But in later years, the Beatles themselves warmed to the cartoon as it had a so bad it's good quality, according to George Harrison. Now, as I was saying, kids, I expect each and every one of you to really... But the question remained. How do you solve the problem of completing a three picture deal when acting in the film is out of the question? Simple, you turn it into an animation. And what happens if you're too busy to voice the characters? Simple, you hire actors to voice them and then pop up for one minute at the very end so as to technically fulfill the agreement to appear in three films under the Beatles name. That is the rather unglamorous way that the film Yellow Submarine was conceived. We all live in the the Beatles didn't have time and were also not interested in the production of the film, which simultaneously made them wary of it as they were of anything made under their name that they themselves didn't create. The band's only real prompt that they gave for the film was that it could be based around the song Yellow Submarine off their Revolver album. I have a, a man who sailed to sea and went to the land of submarines. Sounds like a pretty good story. Paul McCartney envisioned it as something that could rival that of Disney. But given pre-production was occurring during the Summer of Love era, the direction would inevitably follow the utopian message of this period through the aesthetic lens of Sgt. Pepper and vibrant psychedelia. In fact, the reference image of the Beatles in the film is taken from the press launch for the Sgt. Pepper album. The film became such an afterthought to the band that according to George Martin, whenever the Beatles were working on a song that they didn't like too much, they would say, okay, let's put that one aside for Yellow Submarine. So who do you put in charge of an animated Beatles film? 
Naturally, the guy in charge of the Beatles cartoon series, Al Brodax. Brodax hired George Dunning to direct and hired four writers to conceive of a screenplay which, while funny, came out a bit too Americanized. It read as if it were set in on the Bronx or something. So English poet Roger McGuff was brought in to punch up the Liverpudlian patter, which was delivered rather impressively by the voice actors, particularly for Paul and Ringo, I thought. We didn't, didn't imitate the voices. We tried to recreate what we thought were their voices. Is anybody home? Where are we? A holy sea. This place reminds me of Blackburn, Lancashire. Oh boy. I will say that I think the yellow submarine voice acting did kind of become the blueprint for every half-baked Beatle impression you would hear henceforth. Oh God, help, help us. us! Help us! You know the one I mean, the one that everyone does, just that lethargic Liverpudlian. Well that's where all of that stuff came from, you know, that sort of terrible fake Liverpool accent, hello. The Beatles had essentially no input aside from John and Paul occasionally calling up Brodax with script suggestions, such as Lennon's idea for Ringo to be followed by the Yellow Submarine. But the story would overall be rather simple. Taking place in Pepperland, a harmonious, music-loving utopia under the sea, and home to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Pepperland is attacked by the Blue Meanies, who live beyond the mountains and hate music and joy, seeking to remove it from the world. This is where we meet the genuinely frightening Chief Blue Meanie, who is voiced so menacingly by Paul Angelus, who also voiced Ringo and George. The club is losing his touch! Oh, no! The way he goes from soft and quiet to a pure scream is so terrifying. I think I'll tear him up into little pieces. Oh, you don't, eh? The hopeful messages of the 60s are attacked and altered, plus the residents of Pepperland, including the band, are frozen like statues. Only one man is able to escape and travels to Liverpool on the Yellow Submarine to seek the help of the Beatles. Help! Won't you please, please help me? They then journey back to Pepperland where they have many a strange encounter. Poor George, he's canonically always getting electric shocks to his hand. Oh, fuck it now. I just got shocked. Just got a belt, man. Along the way, they meet Jeremy Hillary Boob, PhD, who joins them on their adventure. Jeremy Hillary Boob. Fud. I've never said boob before in a YouTube video, and I've said it twice in this one alone. Booby booby boob boob boob. Once back in the dreary grey pepperland, they wage a rebellion against the blue meanies, who send out the dreadful flying glove in retaliation. Which really reminds me of the Master Hand, you know the final boss from Super Smash Brothers? The Beatles of course win the day, with peace and music being restored to pepperland. But that's just the basic plot. Where Yellow Submarine truly shines is in its spectacular animation, helmed by the film's art director, Heinz Edelman. While Disney allowed for up to four years to animate a feature, Edelman was told he only had 11 months with a rather small budget. So a huge team of animators were brought on board to rapidly bring the story to life. Just a quick side note on the character design, does it remind anyone else of corporate Memphis? You know that art style where they've got big disproportionate limbs and next to no facial expressions that companies have been using for the last six years or so? I'm not putting it down or anything, I just, I don't know, it's just what it reminds me of. Anyway, given the budget and time constraints, Edelman used the limited animation technique where he could reuse multiple character frames to speed up the process. He also decided upon a narrative built around interconnected shorts where the animation style of each section changed drastically from the previous segment in order to keep the audience interested until the end. These various styles of animation center around the various songs in the film, featuring four new numbers and a selection of others from Rubber Soul, Revolver, and Sgt. Peppers. As with essentially all previous films mentioned thus far, these musical sequences are the most engaging part of Yellow Submarine. Beginning with the dark and mysterious Eleanor Rigby, which demonstrates the rotoscoping technique where a live action scene is filmed, traced over and painted to appear like animation, giving Liverpool a grungy, almost Dickensian look. When the Beatles recorded the song All Together Now and shelved it for Yellow Submarine, they clearly had no idea what a blessing that would be for them. In the film, the song makes for an absolutely delightful sequence as they journey through the fantastical ocean landscape. A, B, C, D, can I bring my friend to tea? It's so upbeat and jaunty and I absolutely love it. I also really dig the different typeface styles counting up in When I'm 64. It's just really cool and feels like a proto Sesame Street thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
The sequence for George Harrison's It's Only a Northern Song is, to me, very ahead of its time. The visuals bring Harrison's weary vocals straight into an 80s aesthetic of straight line geometric starkness. The rotoscoping returns for the psychedelic centerpiece of the film, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which is a true feast for the eyes. During the final act, the Blue Meanies are defeated by the Beatles' enduring message of All You Need Is Love. A song that one year before the film's release had been performed for television in what was then the largest live broadcast the world had ever seen. When tasked with writing the song, the Beatles were told it had to contain a message that could resonate with people all across the globe, which the band managed to do whilst also getting their countercultural flower power message across as well. It was a perfect song because it was so simple, the message was so simple, and um, it was a great excuse just to go right in the middle of that whole culture that was happening and give them a theme tune. I love how no turns into now and then no, highlighting both the incredible present moment of the world at the time and the enlightened state of its young people. And what really impresses me with this utopic belief is that they truly commit to it by not banishing the Blue Meanies and instead invite them to live in the musical world of Pepperland. Yes! Ah yes is a word with a glorious ring, a true universal euphonious thing. Engenders, embracing and chasing of blues, the very best word for the whole world to use. It really strengthens the film's message of love, inclusivity, and positivity. In fact, one of the most powerful moments of the film is when the guitar riff of It's All Too Much thunders in on a giant declaration of yes. set to a spectacular psychedelic display of color and joy. This criminally underrated George Harrison number only reaffirms the pure genius of the Beatles that this stunning freakout jam was a song that they cast aside for their leftover film project. In fact, all four of the new songs on here, including It's All Too Much, Hey Bulldog, All Together Now, and It's Only a Northern Song, are some of my favorite hidden gems of the Beatles catalog, but... I'll save any further praise for a different video down the track. And it must be said that George Martin's musical score is really quite fantastic. Let's not take for granted that the man who produced the Beatles' music wrote a lush orchestral score that blends with the pop and rock tunes so seamlessly. It could have been a jarring change going from one to the other, but that's the genius of the fifth Beatle himself, George Martin. Next to A Hard Day's Night, I think Yellow Submarine is the Beatles' strongest film made during their time as a band. It's a film that can be enjoyed at any age, contains plenty of funny gags, and over half a century later is still considered to be a landmark of animation. John Lasseter, co-founder and former chief creative officer of Pixar, has credited the film with generating wider interest in animation as a serious art form after its decades of being considered generally a children's medium, which resonates all the way up to today in the wise words of Guillermo del Toro. Animation is cinema. Animation is not a genre. And as with A Hard Day's Night, Yellow Submarine is a perfect representation of the Beatles at that time in history. It builds on the joy and positivity of their debut film and matures as a perfect vehicle for the band's most enduring message. And strangely enough, it is a documentary of the 60s. Let it be, let it be. The After the UK film release of Yellow Submarine in July 1968, the Beatles were in the middle of the most acrimonious period of their career thus far. They were in the process of recording the many songs that would eventually appear on their self-titled record, otherwise known as The White Album. Most of the songs had been written earlier in the year in India, where the Beatles were undertaking transcendental meditation training from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Given that drugs and alcohol were not allowed at the ashram where the course was held, the Beatles naturally shed the psychedelic excess of their recent projects and entered into a clear-headed period of creative productivity. They had so many individual songs composed, even Ringo had written one, that when time came to record, the band found that they would have to use all three studios available at EMI to see them through. On top of that, tensions flared between John and the other three when Yoko Ono was suddenly present for every recording session. George Martin took an unannounced holiday, their whiz of an engineer Jeff Emmerich quit in the middle of a session, and finally Ringo Starr himself had had enough and left the Beatles for two weeks in August. After the White Album's release in November 1968, it was clear something had to be done. So you may wonder, who was the Beatle that took it upon himself to revive the good spirits of the band? Well, Paul McCartney, of course. Better, better. 
he had been reflecting on the alchemy that had made them great in the first place. Back to when their earlier songs could be recorded in minutes without tons of overdubs and added effects, the Beatles had turned into something that was bigger than any of them had anticipated, and so McCartney's pitch to the band was that they needed to get back to their roots. They would rehearse new songs that were designed to be played well in front of an audience, which was the initial plan, to broadcast a live performance as a television special that would also be recorded as an accompanying album. The other Beatles approved of the idea. Even George Harrison, who had spent the final months of 68 hanging out with Bob Dylan and the band in upstate New York, agreed that this new approach had merit. Crucially for what was about to unfold, Dennis O'Dell, head of Apple's film division, suggested filming the rehearsals in 16mm to use as a separate Beatles at Work television documentary in addition to the concert broadcast. You'd see the Beatles rehearsing, jamming, making up stuff, getting their act together, and then finally we'd perform somewhere as the big end of show concert kind of thing. Michael Lindsay Hogg was brought on to direct. He was the same man who had previously directed the Beatles promotional films, otherwise known as history's earliest music videos, of paperback writer Rain, Hey Jude, and Revolution. And so, over the course of January 1969, the Beatles rehearsed songs at Twickenham Studios and recorded a batch of them at their new Apple Studios where, atop the roof, they finished the project with a live performance heard by the surrounding London public. Six months later, in the midst of the Abbey Road sessions, and on the same day that the world witnessed Man Walk on the Moon for the first time, the Beatles were presented with a rough cut of what was no longer a television special, but a movie made from the rehearsal and live performance footage with a working title of Get Back. Apart from John thinking too much of it was focused on Paul, the Beatles were more or less satisfied with the footage, but asked if it could be edited down to show a nicer finished product. This resulted in the film Let It Be, which was released in May 1970 along with its album counterpart. The Beatles, rehearsing, recording, rapping, relaxing, philosophizing, creating. The Beatles, live in a new motion picture, an intimate experience with the Beatles. A new motion picture. Let it be. None of the Beatles attended the premiere, which was to be expected as they had broken up one month prior. So, with a very different atmosphere to when folks attended A Hard Day's Night just six years before, people all over the globe flocked to see the Beatles' final film. This time, the Fab Four weren't preening pop stars, action heroes, magicians, or cartoons. They were just themselves. Four guys in a room, figuring it out. We open on Paul aimlessly noodling on a piano, a kind of funeral march that to me accurately reflects the overall direction of the film. It's such a grim and lonely shot, particularly with how bare the space is. Like Paul and Ringo are marooned on an island, soundtracked by McCartney's mournful piano. Gosh, Ringo looks sad. I mean, I know he often does, but given the context, his expression plus the music sets the tone perfectly and tells you everything you need to know within the first two minutes. Don't let me down. We cut to the band jamming to an early version of Don't Let Me Down, Maxwell Silver Hammer, two of us, and a few others. In between, we get a bit of chatter, mainly from Paul, discussing things like his early writing partnership with John. It's just we always just sag off every year. Every school day, you know, yeah. go back to my house, and the two of us would just sort of sit there and write. I'd love me do. And... Playing a ragtime jam with Ringo, <laughs> and having that infamous argument with George regarding his guitar playing. Yeah. Okay, well I don't mind. I'll, I'll play, you know, whatever you want me to play, or I won't play at all if you don't want me to play. No, whatever it is that would please you, I'll do it. George debuts a new song, "I'm Me Mine," which is met with indifference from John. Now at Apple, the band, accompanied by Billy Preston, play some new numbers with some more chat in between. The film then ends with 20 minutes of footage from the rooftop concert, and that's Let It Be. Initial reviews of the film were mostly negative. The Beatles, having just called it quits, left a sour taste in people's mouths and naturally informed the public's view that the footage was a documentation of the band breaking down. Some highlighted the terrific music in the film, but such praise seemed rather hollow given the state of the group by May of 1970. It was a sad end to what was the the biggest cultural phenomenon the world had ever seen. Throughout their career, the Beatles had been intrinsically linked to the 60s zeitgeist, and this film would be no different. Along with various other events, like the tragic deaths at the Rolling Stones' Altamont concert, the Manson murders, and a sobering cynicism left over from the hippie movement, 
the Let It Be film contributed to the end of the hopeful dream of the 1960s. And in many ways, the legacy of Let It Be became a significant part of the legacy of the Beatles. And for decades, that's where it rested. Even by the 90s, when the Beatles reunited for the anthology project, Let It Be was still remembered as an entirely bleak period. I think everyone was getting a little tired of us by then. We showed how the breakup of a group works. No, we didn't realise that we were actually sort of breaking up, you know, as it was happening. It was very unhealthy and unhappy. It wasn't until the year 2021, half a century after these events took place, that this legacy was re-examined by the surviving Beatles and Peter Jackson for the three-part series, Get Back. Now, I'm sure that if you've made it this far into this video, you're more than likely to be aware of Get Back and perhaps, like me, have spent hundreds of hours obsessing over the footage. Perhaps you've even seen my video on it where you can learn how and why it was made in the first place. What became rather fascinating to me was going back to watch Let It Be in a post Get Back world. The first thing I noticed is how bad Let It Be looks. It's like really, if we're gonna do a film for cinema, should have been done on 35 millimeters, which is just the best quality. Going from something that was designed to be watched on a small television screen and then scaled up to a proper movie theater meant that the 16 millimeter film had to be transferred to 35 millimeter. 16 millimeter to 35 is a mess. Which resulted in this grainy, dull and dark visual. I'm fairly certain I found the highest res version of Let It Be, but it just looks ghastly when compared to the stunning restoration of Get Back. Something that I also found surprising about Let It Be is that it doesn't necessarily show footage that's any more depressing than in Get Back. To be honest, Get Back actually presents us with far more painful moments that aren't even in Let It Be, such as George quitting the band. When? Now. And the ensuing breakdown of the three remaining Beatles at Twickenham. Let It Be just cuts from Twickenham to Apple and skirts over all that drama. The 1970 film even shows plenty of happy moments that aren't even in Get Back, such as the spirited version of You've Really Got a Hold On Me and Besame Mucho. <laughs> They even do a silly version of the long and winding road. But still, then it be back to the long and winding road. Do, 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 do. And yet the hype around Get Back was that it was filled with this new, happy footage of the Beatles at a creative peak, getting along and just producing excellent music, which it was. The difference is in how the two films were made and the time we've had in between to re-examine their career. We can see in the footage of Get Back that director Michael Lindsay Hogg admits that he doesn't know what story he's telling anymore. I don't know what story I'm telling anymore. Which is readily apparent in Let It Be. The scenes just drift from one to the next without any kind of explanation as to what it is we're watching. Watching. The Beatles will be wearing one set of clothes in one scene, then a different set in another, and then back to the clothes from before, and it makes for a fairly discombobulated watch. Like, I really cannot understate the importance of Peter Jackson's storytelling technique in Get Back. He gave this jumbled footage cohesion, clear timelines, and parameters. And if audiences aren't provided with this kind of structure, if they only get fed aimless rehearsal clips with the odd bit of chatter like in Let It Be, they will feel uncomfortable. They will feel like what they're watching is meaningless, particularly if their key bit of context for the film is the Beatles' inevitable breakup, which is all they had back in 1970. But of course, the Beatles didn't break up right after this. In fact, within mere months of wrapping the shoot, they made one of the most cohesive and enduring albums of all time, Abbey Road. Viewing Let It Be through the lens of Get Back makes for a fascinating watch because you can take the structure and context provided in the latter and apply it to the former. Like, oh, Paul's wearing his blue shirt. That means we're on day 16 with five more till the rooftop. Same with watching Paul and George's argument. We know that much more was said in that moment that provides far more context around the brewing tensions. And unless you painstakingly attempted to comb through the shoddy bootleg audio from these sessions, this is all the context that the audience of 1970 and anyone up to 2021 had of this period. 50 years ago, those shell-shocked fans watching their favorite band aimlessly playing these old standards just didn't have the hindsight to realize that it wasn't that the Beatles were simply messing about and wasting time, it was them attempting to reconnect with what inspired them to play this music in the first place. I see this period as a kind of reset for the band. Without all this, they wouldn't have been in the clear-headed state of mind to create the genius music that appeared on Abbey Road just a few months later. Plus, having spoken to musicians who have watched Get Back, this kind of aimless chatter and unfocused jamming is basically the norm for most bandmates who are in the midst of figuring out their new direction and not the clear signs of an ensuing breakup. 
And that's what's so wonderful about Get Back. As much of the Beatles films of the 60s were reflections of their image and style of the time, so too has Get Back become representative of our enduring love for this band and their music. The hindsight of half a century allows us to appreciate the sheer creative force of the Beatles and their ability to generate outstanding songs even in the most turbulent of times. We know that the Beatles' music is responsible for massively impacting 1960s pop and counterculture. But from what we've seen in this video, I think it's fair to say that their films were also a significant part of this cultural impact. The joys of the Beatles' early pop is amplified by their smiling faces and good-natured mischief in A Hard Day's Night that opened the floodgates of possibility for a new generation of young people. The groovy vibe of swinging London in the mid-60s is matched by the effortlessly cool image of the Beatles in Help. The drug-induced haze of 1967 is portrayed with trippy surrealism in Magical Mystery Tour, followed by the perfect vehicle of peace and love with Yellow Submarine. And finally, the end of the 60s dream is crystallized by the sobering reality of Let It Be. These films were acutely reflective of the 1960s cultural zeitgeist, and like how the Beatles' songs and albums essentially influenced the entire spectrum of music henceforth, these movies had a profound impact on the very medium of film as well. A Hard Day's Night, featuring its freewheeling, absurdist style inspired by French New Wave and combined with popular music, was a total revelation. The multiple cameras capturing close-ups of the band's instruments at all kinds of angles and zoomed-in shots of the crowd changed the way music performances and concert films would be shot from then on. The formula for A Hard Day's Night would go on to be adapted for decades to come, notably with the Spice Girls who made their own mark on the genre in the 1990s. Carrying the spirit of the Marx Brothers, the film also birthed a new kind of comedy style that would ripple out into everything from Monty Python to Airplane. And personally I just think that this reaction shot from McCartney is straight out of the office. The film is simply a cultural and artistic triumph, with even acclaimed film critic Andrew Sarris calling A Hard Day's Night the Citizen Kane of jukebox musicals. Help continued the legacy of A Hard Day's Night by aiding in the conception of the music video format. Additionally, the film was the precursor to the campy energy of the early Batman TV series with its bam pow wow fight scenes. Magical Mystery Tour, though it's probably their worst film, aided in forming the basis for what became known as the Visual Album, a combination of songs with accompanying video that would be made popular by artists such as Beyonce with her Lemonade record. The Beatles also showed us here that playing instruments and singing doesn't even need to be depicted in a music video. Instead you can go for something more abstract and wistfully stare at the mountains. This kind of subversion of the mainstream is what made Magical Mystery Tour so ahead of its time. And people like Spielberg, I've read that people like him have sort of said, when I was in film school, we re that was a film we really took notice of. Like an art film. As for Yellow Submarine, writer and producer for The Simpsons, Josh Weinstein, wrote an entire article in The Guardian where he called it the birth of modern animation itself. The first of its kind that allowed the audience to laugh at themselves while still feeling entertained. It gave animation the permission to be for kids and adults alike, without which, according to Weinstein, we'd have no Simpsons, Futurama, South Park, Toy Story, or Shrek. Let It Be, though since having been eclipsed by Get Back, was a massively influential entry in the rockumentary genre. Along with Don't Look Back and Gimme Shelter, this was one of the earliest times we'd been up close with music legends to see them interact, rehearse, and perform, which simultaneously led us into their behaviours, anxieties, and the creative process. Without these movies, the Beatles would still likely to be considered the greatest band of all time, but because of the existence of these films, we not only have a stunning visual record of the 1960s, but the very foundations on which pop culture and modern cinema now stand. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I've been teasing this video since my debut on YouTube three years ago, so I hope it was worth the wait. I'd love to know your thoughts on these movies. What do they mean to you? How would you rank them? And feel free to comment any extra fun facts because there's a ton of stuff that I wasn't able to fit in this video. If you like this and feel compelled to support me, the link to my Patreon is in the description where you can be featured in the credits of my future videos and also gain access to a fairly large stack of extra Beatles videos. I'm I'm closing in on my goal to hit 100,000 subscribers, so please hit subscribe to see more from me and give the video a like while you're there. Otherwise, that's all from me. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs>